Hi, it's Martin, and welcome to another video on my Knit365 YouTube channel. Today's video is a really exciting one, and as you can see, I'm joined by a guest. I've got the wonderful Woolly Wormhead, who has joined me today to talk about their new book. We're going to get into the book. I'm so excited. I've done, I've done homework. <laughs> I've prepped for the interview and the chat. I've got the book. It's really exciting, and I'm... I'm really honoured that you've taken the time to come and chat to me and chat to my community about your new book and all things short row shaping. Um, it's a great book that I was really lucky to get an advanced copy of because Woolly was coming to join me today. So hi, welcome. How are you? Hi, Martin. Welcome. Um, thanks for having me for a start. I mean, I'm really, really pleased that you like the book and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to chat about it and tell everybody what's going on yes should we start with a funny little anecdote because Wooly and I this is the first time that we've ever properly spoken and um Wooly and I have I oh, I followed Wooly on social media for um quite a while on Instagram and Twitter and was it last year or the year before you put out your plea for Ikea furniture in the UK probably Beginning of last year, end of the year before, I think it was like, yeah, last winter. Yeah. So you can see that Woolly is in her studio and has the books and the shelves behind her. But do you want to tell people the the, the IKEA shortage story? <laughs> okay, so I, I live in Italy and um, we were moving home um, for the first time. I was actually going to have a proper kind of studio in a room that was had big nice square walls and lots of light and you know I wanted to have my IKEA Ivar shelving because it's very versatile I could be it's modular I could move it all around and spend ages like making my books but there was an absolute shortage of um Ivar shelving in particular you could buy the uprights I could buy the drawers I could buy the cupboards but I couldn't buy any shelves whatsoever and they'd been out of stock for months and months and months and I've been looking and checking the the um local IKEA websites and the whole of Italy had sold out of Ivar shelves the whole of Italy and I think they were sold out for about 18 months in total you couldn't buy a single Ivar shelf so in my kind of like oh my god how am I going to get my perfect studio because I wanted to get in here and get working because I was working on the book whilst moving house so I needed to have a studio to work in yeah. um I kind of turned to social media I was like could you help and it was fantastic because yourself and several other people all were just kind of like let's see what we can do and and we had lots and lots of Ivar shells being shipped over from the UK to Italy yep. <laughs> my no a lot of them going by my dad bless him and that was it. So I think I looked at the stock check in our, our local one in Cardiff and they were out of stock. Um, and yeah. then I think they came in stock in Bristol. So ordered them, drove across yeah. to Bristol with Mark. We loaded them all into the car. Then we got some packing boxes, shipped them up. Woolly did the shipping, sent me the label and off we get yeah. them. Yeah. I talk sometimes about the, the the good side of social media. We know there's, there's the social media side and yeah. some it's, it's best left over there but there's a good side of social media about connections and bringing people okay. together and that was just a perfect thing that yeah. you wanted that shelf if I could help facilitate that happy to oh. and it was just a wonderful community thing as you said that well, people kind of turned up yeah. for you and said I can get you those and you've got all these shelves being shipped across Europe I know it's it fantastic and my appreciation for it I can't express it enough because you know, I wouldn't have been able to build any of this or organise any of my work or even finish the book that I was working on without it. It meant so much that people were sending me kind of shelves that they had in their garage and, you know, um, and and I think my aunt and uncle had to go and collect some from eBay that then sent them to my dad and then sent over to Italy. You know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it without all of this help and it was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Well, you mentioned... Worth it. Yeah, oh, definitely. And I remember, I'm so I'm a Patreon uh, member of Woolies and I've seen the studio tour. And again, it's a, there's a little nice thing that you watch the video, like they could be my shells. Yeah. <laughs> but if they're that size, they probably are. 
I'm glad you put the camera that that side then. So I, I'll just keep looking at my shelf later. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned then that you're moving house and writing the book. So why don't we introduce the book to folks? So short row color work knitting. Why don't you give people the background? Oh, there's the thumbnail for the video. Um, why don't you give people a bit of an introduction to the book? Okay. Um, should I give the long introduction? I you mean, it's... whatever introduction you want. Right. Um, some of your knitter, uh, some of your followers and knitters might be familiar with my top hat pattern and my elemental top here. There's this. Yeah. This here is one of my most popular and most famous hat patterns. Um, my love of short row knitting started there. Um, I had seen some really gorgeous shawls using short rows to create color work, and I wanted to see whether or not I could do that with a hat um, and it's when you take something that's 2D and flat and try and turn it into something three dimensional it's there's a lot of mind jumping and moving things around that you know not everybody's aware that goes on you can't just take something flat and turn it into so you want nice shaping around the crown and things so that's where I started to explore it and I started to realize that a lot of the existing methods for short row color work beautiful as they were didn't suit my needs. So I had to kind of turn what I was learning about the process upside down and rethink how I was going to create the color work patterns within a confined space yeah. to kind of make a particular shape. And it grew from there really. Um, and I developed that collection, which did incredibly well. Um, and then I started designing more hats and started to learn more about the technique and started as I was, you know, working along refining the process and kind of developing some rules for the process and um developing a new charting method which is something that's you know covered we'll, 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 we'll come on to maps before. later yeah the, the maps definitely they have a they have a whole thing of their own um so yeah that's that's my love behind it um and for me i'm a very 3d person so why i do hats i'm shawls and scarves are beautiful but they're too flat for me they don't they don't they don't do it for me I like to play in 3D I've actually got a background in a textile sculpture so that kind of you know explains that a little bit yeah. um and so what short work color work does is it manipulates the fabric in a different way to a lot of the familiar knitting techniques that we have um and I really like that movement and that manipulation that goes on and the way that once you start playing the short row what it does to color what it does to the fabric yeah um and they they take on life on their own and i really really like it i mean i've seen the top hat i've seen it knit in a single skein of variegated yarn and you can still see the leaf pattern because the short rows are doing all the work there's so much movement within the fabric that the pattern's still there even in a sort in, in one color and so which you talk in the book about, or you use in the book on the short row, you, you use the German short row. Yes. So talk about, is that is that's the, the technique in the book. Have you ever tried it with different short rows? How, how does that kind of technique, or how did that technique um, start for you? I basically stick to working with German short rows because the entire fabric is short rows. So... I, when I first started doing it um, and first started swatching, I was using wrap and turn because I actually, I really, really like wrap and turn as a short row method. I think they, I they, really, they, has, I really they struggle have, with it. it. It's a bit more of a faff, but it's also really, really versatile in the fact that you can do different things with it because depending on which side of the fabric you pick the wrap up from, you get a different decorative effect. So wrap and turn can be quite versatile. Okay. But it is, yeah, yeah. So if you're doing, say, a sideways hat in stocking stitch, then depending on which side of the work you pick the wrap up from, because there's no rule that says you have to pick it up on one side. You can pick it up on either side. You can pearl them together and knit them together. You can make something quite decorative out of a wrap and turn. Um, but for this, it was just too much of a faff. You got to pick the wrap up. I mean, unless you're somebody one of those, um Don in my um, Ravelry group, he's kind of with. There's been a discussion about actually 
um, in the last week about using wrap and sew in garter stitch. He just doesn't pick the wraps up at all, which is like fair enough. For me, that doesn't work because I, I find it gets really messy for me yeah. if I don't pick up the wrap and garter stitch. Um, but everybody's tension is different. But the reason why I went with German short rows for this is because they're really easy to do. They're really easy to knit over. They're really easy to knit backwards. They're really easy to graft, you know, and you're doing all short rows. So you want something that's quick and effective. That's, that's, and German short rows for gar stitch for me is just like, yeah. Yeah. It's just the easiest thing. And in my swatch, which I'll show in a little bit, my, my homework, although it wasn't homework, well, he didn't set it for me. She didn't say you must do swatches before you join. I had the book and I wanted to do some swatches. It was very therapeutic, just the the, the mindless, the, the doing the German short rows and just going back and forth. And all of a sudden the pattern kind of clicks and you know where you're going. You're like, oh, it's it's every other stitch or it's right. Well, that was 15. So that's 13, 11. So it's actually, it was quite easy to watch the telly. And the first time, I was like, no, yeah. still. Mm -hmm. and after a while, it just clicks. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the German short rows are much more rhythmic because you don't have that extra step of having to deal with the wrap. You just, you know, you just pull your yarn over, create your double leg stitch and you just carry on. So there's less, um, less steps to it. It is easier and they're quite clear to see, I think, once you've got used to what they look like. And as you say, I, I mean, when I was designing the motifs, I tried really hard to make them as rhythmic as possible so that there was uh, a way where you could see the pattern emerging. Um, I could have made them, some of them could have been much more complicated. There were a lot that got rejected because they didn't have that same rhythmic motion to them. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And then so within the book itself, then, so we've got 50 stitch patterns and 10 projects. And I think we were chatting just at the beginning uh, before we started recording. I think one of the things that I really like about this is within the book, you have the patterns to make a specific project. So, for example, the shawl that's on the back here, you have that pattern I to make that. Have you got it with you? Yes, I get it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> it's Paola's shawl and it is stunning. Wow. I love that so much. And I said the pattern for that is within the book, but what the pattern yeah. also then tells you, because you have the 50 stitch patterns, and yeah. maybe we can talk about the three different types of yeah. uh, repeatables that you have, but the book enables you to customize that. So the motif that you have around the bottom edge, if you don't want that motif and you want a different motif, you can just switch it out. So I love that fact within the book that it isn't just... It, it says on the front cover, it's the definitive step-by-step -step guide because it isn't just a pattern book where you can just make 10 no. projects. It's not just yeah. a stitched Bible or a, like with a, a load of swatches in. You give yeah. everybody the technique. So was that quite important when I think you said that Vogue Knitting approached you? Was that important to be able to have that mix and match? That it, how did that come about? Yes. Um, I wanted to... I don't know. I mean, I like to be very, very thorough about how I approach things in general, um, writing tutorials, writing patterns. I don't like to leave anything uncovered. So it was really, really important to me. And, and my editor was on the same page about it. It's kind of like, this is a new technique that we're putting into a book for the first time ever. We need to make sure that we cover the lot. Um, and there were um, some really interesting discussions about what we should and shouldn't cover and to what level we should go to. Because it's new, we needed to obviously cover everything, but at the same time, we actually also to kind of like hold back on some stuff. Otherwise, the book was just going to get really overwhelming. I mean, there's a chapter at the end about designing with the motifs. That could be a, an entire book in yeah. itself. Um, so there were some things that I was adamant about using one of them being the maps another being providing all of the motifs in both written and mapped format so the map is um the charting method for this technique and i refer to them as maps because they are literally maps they just tell you which direction we're going and i know we're going to talk about that more but i wanted to make sure that the patterns were provided in both formats so that um we would um cover as many people as possible but also to um, explain how it actually works and try and demystify short rows because 
I live in my world of sideways knit hats. It's always got short rows and and grafting and all of those things. And I love those things. But I, you know, I I know that a lot of knitters are quite intimidated or put off by the idea of short rows and the idea of creating projects that are entirely short rows might be kind of like really, really scary. So we wanted to demystify it and basically just kind of say that, you know, they're not that difficult. Yeah. It's t- it's just a different approach. I mean, it's like anything with knitting. It's like anything in life. Everything's hard until you know how. So we really, really wanted to make sure that we kind of covered all of the techniques as well. So there's lots of tutorials in the book um, covering um, all the key skills as well. And when I got the copy um, of, of the book, I did my usual. So I, I quickly flicked through it and I thought, I'm going to make, I'm going to have a go. I'll make a couple of, of the swatches. And I kind of, I, I jumped straight into the book and I decided, right, I want to make that one. And I looked at it and I was like, this is really hard. I don't understand. Oh my God, it's really complicated. I don't know how I'm going to do this now. And it's like, right, don't do what you've usually done and just jump straight in. So I made a cup of tea and I, yeah. I sat down and I went to the beginning and the introduction is just a few pages in the beginning but the way that you take people through, this is what you're doing. This is the introduction. This is why the fabric is going to do that. This is why you're doing that. All of a sudden, it just clicked. And then also there's the photographs in there. So again, in some books, you kind of have an illustration and you're like, I'm not really sure that that is, I can't picture it. But the photograph, I was just like, I'm just going to remind myself the German short row bit. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden, like in that 10, 15 minutes, so just reading those first few pages, I was like, I've got it. And I went straight yeah. to the to the first section. Yeah. The, yeah. There you go. And I was just like, oh my God. It it just I felt it click. It clicked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then when it does, it's really lovely, isn't it? When it kind of like makes sense when the things fall into place. I mean, one of the biggest concepts about making short row colorwell work, and it's a rule that needs to be remembered but it's also the rule that can be broken but it's about the integrity of the fabric and balancing the fabric so yeah. whenever you do short rows that create say um this is one of the swatches so you you have these short rows that create these lovely organic forms but you have to remember that you need to balance them up to maintain the texture of the fabric this is one instance where blocking out does not solve your issues because you really do need to make sure and by balancing the fabric i mean that every stitch has the same amount of rows worked across it they don't all have to be worked at the same time but by the time you've got to the end of your motif section or your repeat each stitch will need to have the same number of rows and as you can see from this swatch they're not necessarily rectangular you can see that the fabric takes on this curve um, and that's because short rows have got a bias in them. You know, um, when you kind of stack like K2 together decreases for a crown shaping or an SSK decrease, they have a bias, don't they? When you stack them and they twist the fabric one way or twist it the other way. Yeah. Short rows do exactly the same. Okay. So where, so where you place your short rows can have an impact on how the fabric moves. So I've used that quite deliberately in designing a lot of these motifs. Um, gone off on a tangent. Um, well, but yes, but that's one of the, well, that's one of the, yeah, do read the beginning of the book and learn about kind of what it what it is, where I'm coming from and what that key rule about balancing the fabric and maintaining the integrity of it. Because once you've got that understood, you can then start to kind of like realize that, okay, I've done that short row and that one, and then I'm going to work these other ones on that side to balance it all up. And then it, you start to see the building blocks coming together. And they said on, on, on one of these is the, so let's, let's start talking about some of the bits in the sections in the book then. So we've got kind of the three types of motifs. Okay. Yes. The, 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 um, this adjustable one, isn't it? That's an adjustable. Yes. Um, when this wasn't decided right at the very beginning, when I started writing the book, um, when I had my first um, meeting with my editor, he asked about whether we could do short row. There were quite a few discussions that come up. Um, one of them we wanted to say, like, can we do short row colour work in stock and stitch? And I was just like, no. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was just kind of like, it doesn't work in the same way. You don't get the same diet. Um, 
same kind of movement. It doesn't bounce in the same way. Gar stitch hides short rows really, really well. So the fabric looks much more kind of like intense and beautiful. In yeah. stock and stitch, it can tend to be a bit messier. Um, and then he was like, can we do some in the round? And I was just like, hmm? yeah. At that point, I hadn't actually worked out any short row kind of work methods in the round, but I knew that I could do it. And it was a very kind of unusual thing for me to agree to do to something that I hadn't actually already done and tried and tested. I don't normally agree to things like that because they, they make me panic. Um, so as we were working on the book and one of the one of the things we agreed on, that I was going to be working with my regular tech editor, Deb, who's absolutely fantastic. And I've got a really good working relationship with. And she also knows my work inside out. And I was sort of like, that was really, really critical to making sure this was all going to come together because I couldn't write this book and then have somebody who didn't know my work or know what was going on coming afterwards and take edit it. Yeah. Um, so as I was working through, I was kind of like, I started off and worked designing the first few motifs. Then I could see that they were starting to form in different ways. There are some motifs that I was really enjoying, but I'm thinking, it's not going to work in the round. Do I want to bin that motif? Because not really, I really, really like it. So what do I do with it? And then there were other ones it's like, okay, yeah, I've got the work and then the round as you sorted out, lots of swatching and kind of bending Deb's brain on that one. Um, she had to go away and knit it a few bits and try and work out what was going on. Yeah. Um, and then it started to form into the fact that there were going to be three categories of motifs that had different purposes and different constraints and strengths. Yeah. So the adjustables, which are the ones that you had there, there's only a few of these. These are kind of like, if I hold them up, there's one of my little swatches here. Um, that's the direction you're knitting in, but obviously it can be used that way because, again, that's the great thing about gas stitch. It's really yeah. good for modular work. Um, sideways, modular, I can do all sorts with it. So the adjustables are a good place to start, and the great things about them is that in the book, you've got a, like a standard repeat box that you get on a chart. You can extend it or shorten it. So you get the idea of moving the short rows. And as you extend one section, then you can either kind of extend or decrease another section. And it helps you understand the whole balancing of the fabric and how, you know, there's a, you know, always got to be uh, the short row to work against that one. Then come the stackables. These are the ones that are probably my personal favorites. These are the big, bold kind of, statement pieces so you've got kind of things like this this yes exactly that i mean it's just like they're just really really nice and bold and strong yeah i love this so much yeah um actually yeah that's actually my way <laughs> <Yay. laughs> <laughs> and mine's um, like yours so i think i passed my homework <laughs> yeah definitely um the, and these ones are what I would have started with with my hats, for instance. Okay. Nice statement pieces and motifs, nice strong pieces of short row colour work. Um, but they don't work in the rounds. Some of them can be adjusted in the same way that the adjustables can. Once you get familiar with where the, the extension points might be, I didn't include them in the book because that was going to overcomplicate it too much. But once you get more familiar, you realise actually you can elongate this or you can make it shorter. There are places to do it depending on the motif. Yeah. But then I was kind of like, okay, the ones that need to work in the round are a whole other category. So you've got the adjustables that can be adjusted. They can be worked in the round. They just can't be repeated in the round. So you can adjust it, like elongate it all the way around so that it forms a circle. Yeah. You just can't repeat it in the round. These can be stacked vertically, but of course, if you work it sideways, you can work them continuously and then join them and it becomes something in the round. Yeah. But to have a short row colour work motif that repeats in the way that we are familiar with most stitch patterns repeating, to be able to repeat across and above, took another level of thinking. And in the book, they are the biggest charts. They take up the most space. They're not actually, there's four adjustables Four, uh, 23 stackables and 23 repeatables. But it looks like there's more repeatables just because the instructions take up more space. Yeah. But they end up being kind of like quite 
interesting different um there's some there. really lovely motifs in there yeah um there's this where's there i've got a favorite here there's some things that do not look like what you would expect from short row color work but they're absolutely beautiful but they're all entirely short rows and that was another thing that i really wanted to do with this book because when most of the other short or when people think of short row color work or what is most commonly used in shawls and scarf patterns that use it are the leafy organic forms yeah and i wanted to show that short row color work is something beyond that so there's some really strong geometric pieces. Yeah. There's these ones like this that clever use of slip stitches. You just kind of break up the motif and it is still all short row color work. Yeah. But the what the short rows that are doing the work are in the background and you've got line broken up with cleverly placed slip stitches and you it's still the, exactly the same technique. It's just being used in a different way. So those are the three sections in the book. You've got the adjustables, the stackables, and the repeatables. Yeah, and I the the um, the repeatables. You look at them, some of them, and they do look really technical. And you look at it, and you're just like, "How is that just a short row?" But you know, I because I've I've flicked through the book, and you can see how it is a short row. And then once you see it, and you look at the map or follow the written instructions, you get your head around, and you're like, "Ah, oh, that's so clever!" And as you said, it's just a German short row. It's just it a is, way yeah. of buying it. Exactly. That is, yeah, it's just kind of trying to show the versatility of what you can do with short rows when you play with colour. It's not just going to be this one kind of like this. I mean, they're beautiful, these organic leaf life forms. Yeah. But it's more than that. That's, you know, one of the things. I mean, Powell is sure, coming back to that, that's it's not worked in the round. But this motif is one of the repeatables because the repeatables can be worked flat and in the round. And in the book, there are two sets of instructions for each because if they're worked flat, there is a slightly different writing, slightly um, different pattern to when they're worked in the round. So you've got the set of instructions for each. Yes. Yeah. Another reason why the repeatable chapter is a little bit longer because you know you've got two sets of instructions. But I provided all that for you, so nobody has to work that out. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's all there. So let's talk um, a bit about the creative process then. So you just, you you flashed up a load of the swatches as you were going. Where do you kind of, do you, do you see a shape outside of the house, for example, and then think, oh, that's an interesting shape in nature that I can try and turn. So how, where, where do you get your ideas for the motifs from? And actually, do you start with an idea in mind and just sit there with some yarn and needles and have a play and just see what develops? I think it's a bit of both. I think as I was, um, when I first started and I had a blank canvas for, you know, um, Malabrigo sponsored book. So I'd got this like box of Arroyo toned up and it was all kind of like really excited to have all this yarn. I was, I had a blank canvas to do whatever I wanted with the motifs. I was just exploring on the needles and seeing what was happening. And yeah. then as the motif started to develop and I was kind of wanted to make sure that there was a variety and some differences in scale and different kind of um, patterns. Then I was starting to think more deliberately about, about what I was trying to achieve. And the fun thing is, is that I think to some extent, I don't know if you can ever completely kind of, completely interpret an idea into the short roads because they don't always behave like the, th the way that you think they're going to behave. Yeah, because of the way that you have to balance them up and because of that bias. Um, so I think the creative process was a real mix of there will be some days of just see what happens or other days of intentionally trying to kind of like, I want to get this pattern. I want to get something really graphic. How is it going to look? Yeah. Um, so I think it was a bit of both. Okay. Um, and do you have a favourite design in the book? I'm sure this is probably like trying to choose a favourite child, but do you have a... <laughs> a favorite design, either from one of the motifs or actually one of the, the finished projects? The finished projects, I think that's really, really hard for me to say because um, I only designed two of them. I designed the two hats and I had guest designers design the rest. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it was, 
it's very unusual for a book like this. Normally when a stick dictionary or a technique book comes out, the author does the whole lot, including the projects. Um, and I wasn't going to design anything other than hats. And obviously the book needed something other than hats because, you know, people with shawls and scarves help sell books um, patterns. So um, I needed to bring in some guest designers. So that's another unusual situation to have um, that. But it was a, it was a really good process. Yeah. Um, but because of that, I don't know if I can say that there is a favourite pattern. A, because I don't want to upset anybody, but also because they're not my creative children, if that makes yeah, sense. I did. Um, so did you, of... all, did you come up with all of the motifs and then give them the motifs to then design that into an item? How did that part of the process work? They came on board before I'd finished designing all of the motifs. <laughs> um, because... There was a complete learning curve for them as well, you see, because, yeah. again, it's something that's not been formalised or set out as a kind of a technique before. So I had to kind of um, be prepared to teach everybody what to do and how to do it. Um, and we also had to work alongside each other. So when a lot of the designers were working on their projects, there was an awful lot of the motifs that hadn't been developed at that point. Right. Um, so um that's just the time constraints that's just the way it worked you know because there was a deadline and there's only so much development everybody could do at a different stage before they pass it on to someone else so there was a lot of moving parts at different yeah. time a lot um and poor deb was trying to keep up with you know uh the designers kind of messaging me going am i doing this right what's happening here and deb and me kind of going Deb, can I repeat it this way? And is this going to work? And so it was, you know, it was just kind of, um, yeah, it it kind of got quite intense at a few places. It worked out though. I mean, the projects turned out brilliantly. Yeah. Um, and see, I, of... I love hearing that because I love that kind of behind the scenes stuff. Like, you know, there's a finished book, yeah. but it's often the process that you and the designers and the tech editors and your editor and everyone's had to go through yeah. over many, many months to get to that finished yeah. item that we then get to see. Yeah. I think I think this, from my experience of talking to other designers that have published technique books, this has been slightly unusual because of the guest designers and because the technique needed to be formed and written and explained. Um, you know, because it's because it hadn't been done, there weren't any books like it beforehand. So you know, I don't know. Uh, writing a book on lace techniques or something it's kind of like there was already some knowledge of lace already in existence so people have already got something to build on and work from yeah. um so yeah it's it was a sharp learning curve in a few places it, <laughs> it, was, it definitely was we uh, the the deadline manuscript deadline was i think the first of may and we were still editing at the beginning of November, it, right up to the kind of the dates for print kept getting pushed back because we kept kind of going, no, we need to work on this and we need to work on that. And it was just, yeah, you know, it's really, I didn't answer your question about favourite motif, did I? Uh, no, I don't think you did, actually. No, no. It, I, it, I, it was lovely background and in, information about what the, <laughs> the behind the scenes of the book. But yeah, could could you pick? A yes, most... I've got a, I've probably got a couple. I've got one of this one. Yeah, love that. Wait, is I just really love, not just because of the motif shape that it makes, but I don't know. I don't know if it's clear enough. The background as well. There's a yeah. whole pattern going on in the background. Again, yeah, that's another the, 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 the shape of the short rows. Yeah, that's again something that um, I talk about in the book. There's as the the short row color work is as much about the foreground uh, the background as it is the foreground. Yeah. There's positive and negative space going on because what the short rows in the background are doing have an in, have a play on what the short rows in the foreground are doing. Yeah. Um, this is another favourite. Um, if you can see this one, it's kind of cupped. Yeah. Outlined, and this was one of the first ones when I went. I want to do this. How do I do this? And it was like ah, slip stitches. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. Uh, yeah, that was that was a kind of a penny dropping moment for me. But then there's other ones like these. So you, this oh, is that. one of the first geometric ones I did. 
And you can see here that the short rows are making a completely different shape to so they are in this organic one. Yeah. And this is where the bias that short rows have comes into play because I've placed them in a particular way so that kind of like forms a nice kind of more rounded shape, whereas the way they're placed here creates a harder, more geometric shape. Yeah, so. definitely. And um, so so people are listening to this now. We'll, we'll, we'll put all the details for where folks can get the book um, in the description box. But if I'm, so I'm someone listening now and I'm a, a, a beginner, I guess, who, someone that would be new to short row shaping. It's kind of what advice would you have for them to get started? Where would you recommend that they start within the book? Start, read through, have a practice. <laughs> yeah, do a read through it. Don't dive in. I'm terrible <laughs> if I get a new technique book. I just dive into the projects or the motifs and have a look and don't necessarily read the beginning matter, but the beginning matter is really important. Um, start with one of the simple projects, for instance, this is um, Carrie Bookish's shawl, uh, scarf. Sorry, it's not shawl, it's scarf. And it is designed specifically for beginners trying the technique out. And it is one of the adjustable motifs scaled up and repeated over and over and over in a nice worsted weight yarn. And yeah. there's not, you know, the repeats are very short. You've got all the tutorials that you need to, in, to do your short rows and to cast on in there. And it's a really, really good one to just kind of get in and practice with. Yeah. I've had beginner knitters dive into my elemental hats. And because they're new to knitting and they haven't kind of thought to themselves or nobody's told them that short rows are scary, they shouldn't do it. They've just dive straight in and made successful hats. So I think that's one of the things you want to do is just short rows are not difficult there. You just give them a go. Yeah. You know, it's try it out and there are beginner projects in there that are designed specifically for people to give it a go and get something out of it. And the other thing I like within the book is that you've got written instructions and the maps, mm -hmm. which we'll come onto the maps now, but I think obviously some people like a pattern um, with a, a t um, the, the map or, you know, a table that you can follow an illustration. Some people prefer yeah the written and I think I used both when I was doing my swatches and the first mm -hmm. one I started I followed the written instructions because I liked just you told me what to do yeah and then I thought right I need I'm, I'm going to try and understand how the maps work and actually by having just followed the first few rows written then mm -hmm. move it to the map I'd already started part of the swatch and I was like ah oh, that's what that means in the map and actually having both side by side was incredibly helpful. And I think, again, in some patterns, it's either charted. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. Illustration. It's either charted or written. It's not very often that you get both for every pattern. Mm -hmm. No, I I wanted to make sure there was both in here. I try and put both in most of my patterns. Um, when the elementals came out, they were just charted, but they've got written as well now. I think it's really important to have uh, both together if you can because everybody thinks in different ways and processes the information in different ways yeah. but yeah the maps are any new type of charting and this is kind of like um one of the things that i'm actually kind of really really weirdly excited about because it's kind of like a method that i developed to try and make sense of what i was doing when i first started design with it and it clicked with so many people when I first started to um, use it in patterns. And especially, as you say, a lot of knitters were kind of coming onto the forums and saying, look, I can't use charts, what am I meant to do? Mm. And then we talk them through the process and there's a blog post on, um, on my website as well that tells you how to navigate it because they are literally maps. And then once people kind of realized they were kind of like things did click into place because what the maps do is all guard stitch and all they are doing is telling you which direction you're knitting in and which color you're knitting in and whether you go back that way or that way that you don't have to think about what the stitch is meant to represent what the symbol is meant to represent or what it's meant to look like on the right side or the wrong side you don't have to worry about all of those things it's just which direction you're knitting in yeah. and you can either use your yarn towel or use a stitch marker or whichever and then just teach yourself am i working away from the stitch marker or am i working towards it and that's it you know, and what colour you're working in. Um, let me just, there are some sample maps at the beginning. I'll try and, some of them, as I say in the book, do get a little bit big. 
Um, let's see if I can find a nice I like easy the fact one. Even the way that you said about the arrow, because often when as a beginner you look at a chart and you've got to yeah. remember that you know rows, the, the, the odd numbers, the one three five, they're they're on the right side, or your two four six is the wrong. The map just there literally is an arrow that says you're going that direction and that yeah, direction. That's it. it takes the thinking away and just. Yeah you're really clear this is what I want you yeah. to do rather than sometimes you you look at a pattern and you're like I'm not sure what the designer wants me to do here and I'm not in their head I can't think that way yeah yeah no 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 I find that um uh I find knitting charts can be quite difficult I can't follow other people's knitting charts because I mean I've I've got ADHD and I'm autistic so and and how I process the information that's written down as a symbol I have to jump through several steps of translation in my head and they're like executive function hurdles and sometimes I just can't compute yeah um and so I wanted to remove that because that's that that was that that information is not necessary you only need you to worry about what direction you're going in so that's that's I hope this is visible here so this is um a sample is that close enough can you is it it's so, tell you what if, if you're okay with me showing that as a map i can actually i'll put the image on screen are you okay with that okay yeah yeah, yeah I'll, pop that. That image, I'll pop that image on screen now and then people can see a closer okay. what we're looking at um so it does literally just tell you which way you're going and which way and you know you don't even have to worry about what's the right side or wrong side you don't have to think about any of that you know that will work itself out in the yeah. process yeah, you don't have to do anything like that at all. Um, and so it is a new method of charting, but it kind of needed it. The short rows don't fit into that grid-like structure of a knitting chart in the same way that the majority of stitch patterns do. Yeah. You work here, it's kind of like you, it's, it's, it's that manipulation of fabric going on. You're not working on the same stitches all at the same time. You're working on a chunk of stitches over here and then a chunk over there and a chunk there. That You know, you can't um, make a knitting chart bend in that way. So yeah. I had to come up with something different. Um, but the maps, as I say, when I, when I was first talking about it with my editor, I said, look, the maps can be quite big, especially if you're going to be, you know, repeating them the repeatable maps when people look at it in the book you know they, they do have they can get a bit unwieldy um um but and again, i probably was was guilty of that when i flicked to the end it was like map one of two map two of two and i was like oh right close oh. it which was again it's like just go and read page one like who starts a book yeah. at the end? you never you never read at the end you always start at the beginning it's like why are you jumping straight in there <laughs> yeah yeah um but I, I argued for them to be in the, and it, we knew that the book was going to be really, really tight on space and page count. Um, and we did max out every single little bit of space within the book. Um, but I think it's been worth it because the maps are going to make a big difference to the way that people understand how what's happening in the fabric, which I think is really one of the things that's often missing from patterns and techniques that are taught is explaining what's actually happening within your fabric what's happening, what your stitches are actually doing, what they're actually doing to each other and the relationship they have with each other. Um, and that's another thing I like about this is that you you get to see that you can't avoid it. You get to see that, what it's doing, Absolutely. the building blocks. Are there any common misconceptions that knitters make when doing short, cut, short row colour or, or things that you think could trip people up that might be something that you could um, point out? Don't worry if it doesn't look like what you think it's meant to look like. <laughs> Because I've got one on, I've got one on the needles now, and this is this is um, this motif here, and it's a smaller one on the needles, and we can see that we've just kind of worked this section here, and it's already kind of distorted because it hasn't had the balance in short rows put in that would make it into a rectangle, yeah. and as it grows on the needles, it will distort and it will look weird because you are working a section here first and another section and they're not it's not it's not a linear process so don't worry if it doesn't look like what it's meant to look like so long as your short rows the right number of stitches um are right and don't forget that the short road stitch itself isn't included in the stitch count that's a key thing um 
so long as you're doing short rows and you're following the process it will look like how it's meant to look yes because that was an interest because it'll be say knit 18 then german short row so in my head i was almost thinking about i'm knitting 19 because i'm knitting the 18 then i knit the 19th which is where i, I then turn it and pull the and leg make a short row. yes the short row stitch is not included in the stitch count but yes if you if that's how you think if you're doing the sh german short rows then yes it would be if it says K17, you'll go K18 and then turn on the next row. And you've got 17 stitches and a short road stitch. But yeah, yeah the, the short road... The map is really helpful for that because the map yeah. tells you the number that you're knitting, then it tells you to German short row. Yes, exactly. That's um, putting the number of stitches actually in each short row within the within the maps is really, really helpful guide. So you don't have to sit there and count them either. You know, it just tells you how many you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. But that balancing point is a really good tip because yeah, when I was making this one, um, similar motif, I had the the second light, I, the color B, on the needle. But you can see all of this section hadn't yet been knit. It's worth it. But again, mm -hmm. by looking at the map, I could see that I was then coming to almost fill that bit in. Yeah. That then yeah. gave. Me, so it is almost, and I say this a lot in other with other patterns and things is just trust the process. Yes, it, it is one you do need to trust. Yes, it is. And don't be intimidated by short rows. They're really, really not. They are, they're just an incomplete row. That's it. Oh, absolutely. And I, I said, I learned so much just from doing these two swatches, just to almost understand my knitting a little bit more and understand what it was that I'm, that I'm doing. So it was really great to be able to have a little practice um, yeah. and, and kind of see how the fabric is different. I did start this one and because I used Aaron yarn. I just grabbed some, that was on the side um yeah, I, yeah. I started knitting marks like what are you making that's massive and i was like aaron yarn five mil needles <laughs> yes and then i switched and then i switched over then to a, a more reasonable fingering weight yarn for the second one <laughs> yeah uh, yeah that was that one would have been really big but that's the that's the great thing about these is they can be scaled up and down with um different weight yarn i mean in the book we have 10 projects but there are actually um, two of the two of the patterns are written for two different weight yarns. So Carrie's scarf, for instance, is written for worsted and sock weight, and one of my hats is knit, knitted for worsted and arroyo because we used Malabrigo sock, Malabrigo arroyo, and Malabrigo worsted. And because I'm me, there are four projects for each. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like to divide things up into kind of like um, uh, nice kind of groups of numbers. So there are um, examples in there of what, what will happen if you kind of grade it up and down and use it from weight yarn and seeing how it plays. Yeah. And I guess that's really interesting. Then. So that one of the questions I was talking about is like, what um, what's the future of this as a technique? And it's almost in, it's an unending number of variables that you can use this yeah. or to create pattern and motif. Kind of where do you see that going? Um, one of the, in the design chapter right at the end of the book, um, which was something I, I was quite um, keen to put in. You don't always get it in stitch dictionary books. You don't normally get a kind of, this is how you use the motifs and these are some of the pitfalls that you run into late. Yeah. Um, with stranded colour work, for instance, when you work stranded colour work in the round, you'll often have a jog unless you kind of do moving marker techniques. Nobody explains that in the stranded colour work books, but I wanted to kind of cover that so that people would have all the tools to be able to go away and design something with it. Yeah. And what I did was I worked with each of the designers to try and encourage them to use as many different construction methods and the motifs in as many different ways as possible. So that we had a variety of examples to see what you could do with the technique. And then in the designing chapter, I then kind of like talk through some of the different possibilities and reference what the designers have done. Um, so there's a number of modular techniques, there's a number of sideways ones, there's ones that have worked in the round, there's some that have worked flat, you know, the motifs have all been used in different ways. Um, and there's even one like the mitts, hang on a minute, let me just- Oh, the mittens, that's gonna be, that's one of the projects I'm making, Mark has asked for the mittens. Yeah, these I'm sure are gonna be really, really popular. This is one single motif scaled up to be the entire project with the thumb gusset added in. So this is this is the motif in the stitch dictionary. Yeah. And what Shark did was that she 
use the motif and then she mirrored it. So you've got either side. So kind of like you don't even have to repeat it because some of the motifs are so big that you just kind of like they can be a statement by themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's you can do modular with it. I will, you know, I, modular knitting often gets a bit of a bad rep or it goes out of fashion. I don't know why, because it can be really, really fun. And garter stitch lends itself brilliantly to do that because of its square gauge. So yeah. there's, a num there's a few that have got um I mean, Paula Shaw is a is a modular piece. She's got a knitted on border. You know, um, so I'm hoping that um people will kind of like branch out from thinking about knitting in the round and start turning sideways and start doing some more modular or start making big statement pieces out of it or just even if they're just using blocks and joining them together I mean there's so much that you can do with it yeah so much you can do with it and that's really helpful and I like that chapter in the book because then if you have people that are kind of aspiring designers you know yeah. it gives you a little bit of a framework to kind of take some of those motifs and make a shawl for yourself or make a scarf for yourself um, and you've got an example of how somebody else has done it as well, which I think is really, really helpful. If you're going to be designing, you can kind of like, ah, oh, right, that's how that designer has used that and done that technique with that. You've got an example of it. But that's a really open approach for you, though, as well as a designer mm -hmm. to kind of share, I guess, a little bit of your creative process and how you've talked to us today about where you started with some of the motifs and um, and some of the projects, but almost putting that out there to enable people, you know, that might be watching that will have the book to yeah. then most design something for themselves and take yeah. the yeah. techniques. But that's quite an open approach that you don't often see a lot of designers. Like, mm, it's my technique, um, which is quite, it's quite nice and refreshing to see you kind of share that with the world. I think I've, I, I don't want to own it. I mean, it's kind of like, I'm really, really excited that I've been given this opportunity to write this book and give this technique, form it into an actual technique that has rules and guidelines, which are all in there. Because every stitch technique has them, you know, every every type of, um, you know, lace knitting, colour work, cable, everybody's got, you know, they've all got their own kind of like do's and don'ts. And this is, you know, if you don't want to screw it up, don't do that. This yeah. is no different. Um and so I was really, really excited to be able to give the opportunity to actually kind of like formalize it and make it become a fully fledged technique that felt like one of the most fantastic opportunities ever. Um, and to have my exploration put in book form and my maps, which is like, I because I, I, I love the maps so much. So I'm just like really excited about the idea of people kind of like having an easier way to chart their knitting. Yeah. Um, but I want to see, because it's so much fun, it's a completely different way of thinking about colour. You don't have the same rules about mixing colours that you do with other colour work techniques, because as I said at the beginning, I've seen my top hat knit in a single skin of barricaded yarn, and you can still see the pattern, because the short rows are doing all the work. It's all about the manipulation of the fabric. It's not just about... Um, put in this colour here and this colour there and or thinking about it in just single stitches you're you're thinking about whole movement going on and it is so refreshingly different to kind of look at colour and look at the way that your knitting is constructed and I just you know I want other people to go away and enjoy it and try it yeah. and see how fun it is um for it to be demystified you know I don't mm. want this sort of and I love that, that the way that, again, the back to the beginning in the introduction, the way that you just explained, this is what you're doing. It tells people the why. Yeah. It explains yeah. why that particular instruction is there. And I really like that. And actually, do you think, how do you kind of see, if you look back on, over your journey, I guess, as a knitting designer, how have you seen that develop and change in yourself and kind of evolve over time? Is that kind of evolved and then culminated in in this book, do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I've always been into techniques and construction. I mean, hats are my thing, but as I try and say to people, I'm not just about the hats. If you think I'm just about the hat, then you're not looking at what I'm really doing. The hats are the, the playground. They're my, that's where I explore technique and construction and play with different ideas out and 
because it's 3D, because that's how my brain works. You know, I get to kind of like um, deconstruct it all and work out what's going on. It's just, and so it has been um, quite an interesting journey to come to here, but it's it's my sideways hats that have led me here. And that's one thing that I fell in love with a long time ago. My first book on sideways knit hats was published in 2007. Wow. And yeah. Um, and that was all, that was a book of 24 sideways knit hats. There wasn't any short row color work, but there was lots of other interesting things like mixing stitch patterns with short rows. And it was a complete flop um, because <laughs> It was it, it, it remained my nemesis of this like first book, but because they were all sideways and all short rows, and nobody was doing anything like that. Even now, there's not I'm there's not many people exploring sideways knit hats. So, um, it's kind of like I've been doing this thing with exploring with working with short rows for nearly twenty years, and. Yes, it's a kind of bit of a bumpy road to come into that, but it's the sideways hats. Thinking about how I shape the hats because it's not flat, you have to have the 3D shaping that goes into something yeah. that's led to this. Yeah. I think uh, one of the really funny things was um, I didn't actually didn't realize you were a patron, so you've probably heard me talk about this before, but trying to kind of like in the, and when, we, when I've done the studio updates, is talking about how actually for the motifs, what it was like working with something that was just completely flat. Mm. You know, um, that was, that felt like a really, really different thing for me to do. Yeah. Because I'm so used to working in 3D that I actually had quite some quite good fun just kind of like going, oh, oh, I can, oh, I can make it flat and it can go like that, go like that. And I haven't, I wasn't thinking about get going around this way. I was thinking in a dimension that I don't normally think in. And I think for a lot of other designers, it's the other way around. They're thinking 2D and then the 3D comes after. Yeah. Um that's a sorry if that's the wrong assumption, but that's generally what I've learned from talking to most other designers anyway. Um and so did you find that quite rewarding then having the opportunity to think in a different shape and think? Yeah, yeah, just think about it being flat because it, it, it um, as I was starting to do that, I was, I was thinking, right, okay, this is how I would shape this as I was making this into a hat. Um, so it did kind of, that thinking was still going on, but it was, yeah, it was kind of fun to just work on the flat swatches and see what I could do with them without given myself the extra constraint of it's got to fit a specific 3D shape. Yeah. And I think that that was, it was quite freeing in some ways. Yeah. Good. And that, that novel. Got your, novel. <laughs> but your passion for the project and, you know, it, it's been such a big part of your life, which is understandable why yeah. it's a passion, but, and this is why I was really happy when, um, you know, you, you, you sent the notice out saying, I'm, I'm the book's going to be launched. I'm happy to talk to people. And I did a kind of, I'd love to have you on. And, oh, my. and I was just like, oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, and like, so lucky that you yeah. found the time to come and talk to us today. Um, it's been great to hear that passion directly. And not for me to just get mm. a book and go, oh, I've got a new book. If I flick through this, some really great things in it. It's really yeah. nice to have you here and bring it to life for people. Yeah. Well, thank you. for. I'm glad you asked. Well, I'm glad you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? So beyond the book then, so apart from the book, what's next coming up for Woolly Wormhead that folks can expect to see? Finally, a new website, hopefully very, very soon. I've been working on building a new website for a couple of years. It's been a long build because it's big. Um, and then... Um, I've got some new hats that I want. I'm I'm actually itching to get back to knitting hats. I really am. I've missed it um, because it feels like I haven't designed any hats for a couple of years because we're working on the book and then moving home and then working on the website. I can't kind of think, I want to get back to my 3D knitting. So one of the hats I'm wearing um, is one of the new designs. These aren't coming out. If I get the collection finished, they'll be in autumn. Okay. Um, and this is another one. Oh. So what, I'm, so what I wanted to do 
Um, I wanted to do something with short row color work that was not sideways. There was no grafting. There was no working in the round. It was simple, more accessible short row color work that just kind of like rules are quite minimal. So yeah. they kind of let the, the the motifs take center stage. But technique wise, um, it's just worked flat and vertically. Then you've got a guard stitch mattress seam at the back, which is you know, almost invisible um, and some very simple decreases. And these are worked on proportion as well so that they're adjustable. And, and I just wanted to make something that was more, bearing it, you know, this, this discussion we were having when we were working on the book and then we talked about trying to find some way of making it um, easier for beginners to access the technique. Yeah. So I, this is what my premise was with this one. And if you don't mind my messy hair for a minute, I'll take this off. And this is just kind of like, just simple. I really like the color work. Yeah, so just the, this, just the proportion of it and just kind of like having something simple going on. It's still, it's yes, it's stripes, but it's done with short row color work because they're not complete stripes. And so you have to balance them out and you do the same principles as you do. And so that's what I'm working on next is something kind of um, hopefully less intimidating, more accessible so people can give it a go and see it in a different context. Yeah. Uh, but I would absolutely say, though, as someone that's looked at the book and then, as I said, ju jumped in and then went back to the beginning, th there is absolutely nothing to be intimidated by. You know, you're not paying me to say nice things about your book. It genuinely is. <laughs> Um, an, an honest review, having read it and seen how you get taken through the techniques, you know, I can't wait. There's lots of projects. People know I kind of have, I'm in double figures again for my works in progress. I like starting things. I'm not very good at finishing them, um, but there are already some projects that I want to start and that will be jumping onto my list because it's such a clear book in how yeah. you customize it. And that's the bit I'm, I'm looking forward to is taking some of the projects at the end and okay. picking some of the motifs and seeing what I can come up with. So I'm definitely looking yeah. forward. The, the the swatches definitely gave me kind of an itch to scratch in terms of creating yeah. something. So yeah, it's a really, really great book. So tell people, so when is the book officially launched? So you're here, to, you're here chatting to us now. Is there an, is there one launch day? Is it a worldwide different dates? Different? Right. There's two different dates that I have at the moment. Um, In the US, the official date is April the 16th. In the UK, it's a month later, so May 16th, 14th, around there. I okay. don't know about Australia. Um, not 100% sure on Canada or elsewhere in the EU. Those are the two firm dates that I have. Okay. Um, which means that Sixth and, six and Spring Books, which is the book side of Bow Knitting, they're going to be getting the stock of books really soon. Um, so, yes, it's coming out in the next few weeks can't believe it my first it's finally here it's been, well, it's been two years since i had my first meeting with my editor you know uh two years um of my life gone into this book um so yeah okay. it's not far away so those two dates, and we'll pop those in the description box below. And then if you let me know when you have the other dates, I can talk that out, it, mention it in one of my weekly posts. Yeah, so I can... let other people know, because we have people watching from all around the world. Um, yes. So we can let folks know when it's uh, when it's available. It is up on the various Amazons. Okay. Um, um, I don't, I'm not sure who's managing the distribution in Australia and New Zealand, but I know that for North America and it's Ingram and for Europe and the UK, it's GMC. So they're both big distributors. So if you're in a yarn stores are watching or if any of you followers are watching, you want to go into their local yarn store and say, I want this book. GMC in the UK and Europe, Ingram in North America and yeah. Canada. Um, so... I have been asking for other dates, but at the moment I've not got anything, but as soon as we, I get anything, I'll let you know, but yeah. Amazing, thank you. And I was very uh, kindly gifted the um, one of the sample books um, from your editor, which was really lovely. Um, and I was gonna purchase a copy already. So what I'll do is I will give my purchase copy away as a prize to someone watching <laughs> on the channel. So if anyone's watching and wants to be in with a chance of winning a copy of Woolly's book, 
just leave us a comment below. Let us know what you think about uh, the book. Have you ever done short row color work? Is this something that you're going to be keen to um, get involved in? If you just mention the word woolly, that's how I'll pick out that I know you want to be in with a copy. So obviously W double O double L Y because I'll do a word search for it. So just mention okay, the word woolly. Right. <laughs> I know, just like spell it right. I'll just, if you put the word woolly in the comments, um, I will take the draw on the, let's look for the diary. Uh, Sunday, the 28th of April, 4 p.m. UK time. I will cut it off and then I'll do the draw and I'll get in touch. So actually, if you are anywhere in the world, you know, I'll get the UK copy um, mid uh, mid May, as Woolly has said. Um, and then I will, usual rules apply for competitions on here. I'll ship it free of charge. You just risk run the risk that you might have to pay local customs. I'm not responsible for those. You'll cover that yourself. So if you win and you're in Australia or New Zealand, you could be one of the only people in those countries to actually have a copy because I'll ship it to you from the UK. Um, so definitely let us know in the comments below how you um, thought this uh, found this video. Um, have you knit any of Woolly's patterns? Um, I know I need to read this. Amanda, my friend, um, in my little knitting group, um, her hats are spectacular and she writes a lovely clear pattern. Big fan. When I said that I was interviewing you, she's like, yeah, we had a little fangirl moment. It was lovely. <laughs> Amanda's a big fan of short row knitting um, and has, has done some short row. She likes a wrap and turn and we've talked about how I need and she's she's slowly coming around to German short rows because that's my preferred method. Um, but yes. Yeah, it's... they have different, different, different uses in different places, different ups and downs, you yes. know. I said I just struggle. It, it's it's the flicking and I'm just like, have I done it? And it's just German short row is easy. Slip it, pull it, done. There's no, there's limited thinking with a German short where I said it's easy to watch the telly with. That's kind of my review as a layman. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's been super lovely to have you on. It's been a great way to spend an hour on this bank holiday Sunday. So thank you so much. Um, this video will be going up on Monday. So hopefully folks will be watching this now. Bank holiday Monday here in the UK um folks will be watching that and then i'll be back next week and i'm going to do a more of a monthly roundup so it's been a while since i declared my whips and told people how many we've got we've started a few new things we finished some things i finished my blue socks spoiler um so i'll show off that there will be a sock dance next week um so I'll be back next week. So once again, um, just a final thanks to Woolly for giving up some of your time and being here to talk to us about the book. Um, yeah, I can't yeah. Wait to start exploring. And I can't wait for folks out there to get it and and to see it. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. And also, if you want to, I've been putting posts up on Instagram and other places, just like I'm Woolly Wormhead everywhere. Come and have a look at some of the comments and see some of the posts. And you will also see some of the other designer projects that people are doing. We've got videos coming out of some of the garments and projects and movements. So there's, there's lots more to come and see and promote as well. Amazing. Okay, right. Well, we will leave it there. So thank you very much. And until we speak again, happy crafting.